What's going on guys and welcome back to Footy with an Edge. Chelsea have shaken up a whole lot of trees in the transfer market since Todd Bowley took over the club in May 2022. In just three transfer windows, they've spent a whopping 818 million and 490,000 euros on just 22 players. And while I don't have the exact figures on the next biggest spenders in the same time frame, I'd be willing to bet that no other club in Europe or the Middle East has spent more than 500 million since 2022. So is the strategy to spend that much to overhaul your squad that quickly a sign of incompetence or is it actually genius? Was Todd Bowley actually setting up the squad perfectly for a manager like Pochettino? We'll find out the answers to these questions in this video by talking through Pochettino's tactics to understand what players suit him and his system best, Chelsea's squad and transfer spend prior to Pochettino's arrival, and Chelsea's transfer strategy post Pochettino. As always, please drop a like on the video and subscribe to the channel if you enjoy. And don't forget to turn on all notifications to never miss out on content just like this. Mauricio Pochettino has had probably the most interesting career for a top class manager. His rise from Espanyol to Southampton to Tottenham was rather quick and explosive. He consistently played fast attacking football with young up and coming players throughout his squads. And he was consistently able to punch above the team's weight considering how much each team was actually spending in the transfer market. In his first full season with Southampton, he got them their highest points tally in the Premier League era with an 8th place finish. And in 5 seasons at Tottenham, he finished 5th, 3rd, 2nd, 3rd and 4th with an average of 74 points per season. But he never really gets the respect that his frankly impressive CV deserves because he didn't win a trophy at Spurs and he also didn't win the Champions League with PSG. But I'm going to be really honest here. I genuinely think that Pochettino has what it takes to be a top 5 or top 3 manager and Chelsea might just be the right club at the right time to make this happen. So let's talk about his style of play and in-game tactics so we can try to understand how well this Chelsea squad fits Pochettino. So Pochettino generally likes to play a 4 at the back formation like the 4-2-3-1 or the 4-3-3 but we're going to look at the 4-2-3-1 today. He loves specifically to build out from the back because he wants to create numerical overloads in the defensive third that can translate into overloads in the midfield and also overloads in the final third. So usually his two center backs will split to the edge of the box or just outside the box like this where his goalkeeper will step out to the middle a little bit acting like the third center back. The full backs will then push up higher and wider up the pitch into these sort of areas while the central defensive midfielders will drop to the edge of the box to create almost five triangles that create passing lanes to beat the opposition press. So basically, Pochettino wants his goalkeeper, center backs and CDMs to have great positional awareness press resistance and passing abilities and he wants his fullbacks to be able to get into open spaces beyond the high press of the opposition so that they can pick up open pockets of space like here and here. This not only allows the back three of the two center backs and the goalkeeper to bypass the entire press by playing balls over the top into the fullbacks but it also allows the fullbacks to create overloads in midfield for the next phase of play. Moving further up the pitch we have the four attacking players and the fullbacks that occupy the midfield and attack. And what's interesting here is that the fullbacks being high and wide actually allows Pochettino's teams to maintain an asymmetrical attacking shape. So basically, if the right back pushes forward into these areas here, the right wingers allow to move inwards into the inside space between the opposing left back and the left center back. And now there's a situation where this individual can either interchange with the number 10 who makes this run into the channel here, or he stays in the inside area waiting for a ball from the right back into this channel over here where they can make a run and cut the ball in for a cross. And when you have this natural overload onto one side of the pitch, the opposing team will naturally want to shrink and become tighter onto, over onto this side, which automatically creates all of this space down this channel for the left winger and the left back. So for all of Pochettino's attacking midfielders, wingers and strikers, he wants them to have great positional flexibility so that they can pull opposition CDMs and defenders out of position and create space in other areas or exploit that area directly in case they don't react to their movements. And the biggest thing I want to point out here is that Pochettino's fullbacks are almost his most important position all over the pitch. 
and Pochettino has a similar mindset out of possession. It's all about establishing numerical superiority to make it as difficult as possible for the other team to build out from the back. Quite often, you'll see the typical Pochettino forwards pressing opposing center backs and making it really difficult for them to play the ball out from the back, and either his midfielders or his fullbacks will mark the opposing central defending midfielders, which means it's almost impossible to get the ball out of the back unless you play a long ball or you try a difficult pass through the Pochettino system. So regardless of where you play on the pitch for Pochettino, you need to have high defensive work rates and pressing intensity, and you need to be able to do the short, intense bursts of pressing throughout the 90 minutes, or else you'll be on the bench. So now that we've discussed Pochettino's playstyle and in-game tactics, let's take a look at Chelsea's transfer spending and squad makeup prior to Pochettino's arrival this July. So the 2022-2023 season was one of massive changes for Chelsea, starting with a change of ownership from Abramovich to Bowley, followed by a managerial change from Tuchel to Potter to Lampard. And all of this happened while the club spent 611 million euros to buy 16 players and earned 68 million euros by selling 8 players to get a net spend of 543 million euros. If you think that doing 24 total deals in two transfer windows is a lot, Wait till you realize that Chelsea actually brought in another four players from either their youth team or loan recalls and free transferred or loaned out another 14 players that season. Which brings the number of deals in the 22-23 season to a whopping total of 42. 42 deals in two windows. I'm pretty sure Man United under Ed Woodward didn't do 42 deals in 10 years. But let's actually get down to the nitty gritty of some of these deals to understand if they were good bad or average. Starting with the obvious choice in Enzo Fernandez. 121 million euros is a lot for any player, but it's really a lot for a box-to-box -box midfielder. But he is a really good player with a really high ceiling, and they did get him at 21, which means he can be at Chelsea for at least the next 10 years, probably in his prime. And they also locked him down on a eight and a half year contract, which means the real cost is about 14 million euros per season plus wages. So I'll categorize this one as an average deal because while Enzo is a one of one midfielder, Chelsea probably overpaid by at least 20 million or so. Next, let's talk about the Ukrainian sensation in Mihailo Mudrik. Again, Chelsea probably overspent a little at 70 million euros, but again, they got a young player with a high ceiling which means he could be here for another 10 years, also in his prime. And much like Enzo, they signed him on an eight and a half year contract, which means the real cost is about 8 million euros per season. And to me, looking at this transfer on a high level, I actually think it's a good deal because it's no doubt that with the right coaching and the right atmosphere, Mudrik can be one of the best wingers in the world. He certainly has the talent for it. And I know this argument is based on a lot of ifs, buts, and maybes, but as a top, top European club, you have to believe in your abilities to improve a player that you buy, just like you believe in your abilities to improve an academy player. So I think this is a good one. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Moving on, we have Mark Kukurea and Raheem Sterling, who were both bought for a combined fee of 121 million euros. And I'm sorry, I have to objectively class these transfers as bad deals. Don't get me wrong, both players are great additions to the squad and can have a major impact throughout their Chelsea careers, but to overspend on these two by a combined 40 million euros is just not it. And then when you look at the likes of Bariashil Madueke, Malo Gusto, Karni Chukumeka, and David Fofana, you see a combined 133 million spent on five players who are all under the age of 22. And I like every single one of these transfers. They're all talented young players who have high ceilings and Chelsea locked them down on relatively long contracts. So overall, I see a clear trend emerging here. Chelsea were after a squad overhaul under new ownership where they wanted to lower the overall age of the squad, improve the medium to long-term talent pool of the squad, which you could call future-proofing, and they didn't want to waste any time making this happen. And while it seems like a good strategy on paper, there are three huge issues with this strategy. Because one, they were terrible at identifying relatively experienced players to go along with the young players that they purchased, like Khalidou Koulibaly, Obama Yang, Joao Felix, and even to some extent Raheem Sterling, because they didn't bring a single leader into the dressing room to help gel that squad together. Number two, they were too hasty in spending all of their money, which could have led to costly oversights like the injury-prone status of one Wesley Fofana, a center back that they spent 80 million euros on. 
And number three, all of this chaos meant that Graham Potter was the sacrificial lamb because my God, who in their right mind would do well with that Chelsea last season? So this just goes to show that just like Rome wasn't built in a day, a successful European club isn't built in two transfer windows. But, and this is a big but, was Todd Bowley actually playing 3D chess when we were all playing checkers? Was he thinking two steps ahead while everyone just judged him for the amount of money he was spending? To understand this fully, let's take a look at the 23-24 summer transfer window. In typical Chelsea fashion, they've already bought, sold, loaned out, or released 21 players this summer, with an additional four players joining the first team squad from the youth setup. In atypical Chelsea fashion though, they have a net negative spend of about 47 million euros because they've managed to sell the likes of Kai Havertz for 75 million, Mason Mount for 64 million, and Kovacic, Koulibaly, Pulisic, Mendy, Loftus-Cheek, and Ethan Ampadu for a combined 115 million euros. And in the same summer, they've brought in 25-year-old Christopher Nkunku from Leipzig for 60 million euros, 25-year-old Axel de Sassi for 45 million euros from Monaco, 22-year-old Nicholas Jackson from Villarreal, 19-year-old Leslie Ugochukwu from Rennes in France, 25-year-old Robert Sanchez from Brighton, and 18-year-old Angelo from Santos in Brazil. And overall, I would class this as a very successful summer because they purchased really young and talented players, this time for more reasonable prices than last time, and they sold really well by getting rid of some quality players for great fees like Havertz and Mount, and also getting rid of some deadwood like Pulisic, Mendy, Loftus-Cheek, and Ethan Ampadu. So taking a step back and looking at the Bowley regime so far overall, we see that Chelsea have a net spend of 496 million 760,000 euros in three transfer windows. With this, they've added about 22 solid first team players and gotten rid of 18 first team players. Now, is that a very expensive squad overhaul? Absolutely. Have they tried to do too much too soon? 100%. But tell me one club in world football that has managed to overhaul an entire squad without spending big money outside of Liverpool the first time around under Klopp. Because Man City with Pep Guardiola have spent tons of money since he's been there. Even United with Van Gaal, Mourinho, Oli, and now Ten Hag have been spending loads of money. And even looking at Liverpool now with Klopp, they're having to spend a lot of money to actually rebuild a squad that can compete at the highest level. So spending a lot of money to be successful or have the potential to be successful is a given. But we haven't even gotten to the most important point yet, which is fit. How well does the current Chelsea squad fit Pochettino? Now, I've put together a potential starting 11 for Chelsea this season with some alternatives in each position. So let's see how they fit Pochettino's requirements. Based on what we know about his preferences for goalkeepers, defenders, and CDMs, they need to be good positionally, good against a high press, and great passers of the ball. If you look at the back seven that I have here, you'll see these three qualities in almost all of the players. Kepa and Sanchez are both good with their feet so they can find pretty much any outfield player at will. Thiago Silva, Levi Colwell, Ben Chilwell, and Reese James are all great passers and intelligent enough to find space against the press. And Enzo Fernandez is arguably one of the best passers in the league, along with having good vision and press resistance. The one spot in their team that is doubtful is the second CDM because Gallagher is not really a CDM and Santos is untested, which is probably why they're trying to get Caicedo so bad. Moving into the attacking spots, Pochettino wants good attacking fullbacks who can also press high out of possession. And this is the one spot where Chelsea are absolutely stacked because they have James and Malo Gusto on the right and Chilwell and Kukurea on the left. He also wants his front four to be positionally fluid and good pressers of the ball. And again, Pochettino has some really nice options here. Mudrik, Madueke, Jackson, and Armando Broja are definitely raw, but they have high ceilings and they definitely have the intensity to keep going for 90 minutes like Pochettino ex expects. And Christopher Nkunku is arguably one of the best attacking midfielders of the last few seasons in Europe. And by the way, I think people are sleeping on how good this guy is, but he can definitely play with that intensity and positional fluidity for 90 minutes because he comes from the RB Leipzig system that arguably wrote the book on this type of play. And while Sterling and Ziyech are definitely not pressing monsters, I do expect them to pull their weight to some extent to contribute to the system. So when you have 9 out of 11 positions on lock, 
nine players that are more or less exactly the profile that Pochettino is looking for, you can see why this Chelsea squad is ripe for Pochettino to do his thing. In fact, this squad's average age is 23.24 years, which is younger than the youngest squad that Pochettino ever had in his five seasons at Tottenham. So what's the overall verdict? While Chelsea have overspent by at least 20% across the board, it's probably not possible to overhaul a squad this quickly without spending that kind of money. Only time will tell if an accelerated spending schedule will lead to winning trophies sooner. But one thing is for certain, this Chelsea squad is perfect for Mauricio Pochettino to take over, and whether he gets three to five seasons to deliver success, only time will tell. Thank you guys for watching. Like and subscribe if you enjoyed, and I'll see you next time. Thank you.